Well, hello, Forcey family, and hello to anyone else who is watching at this time from wherever you are and whenever you are. I'm glad to be with you. I want to let you know that I am thinking of you. And what I mean by that is it can be hard when you're preaching to an empty room like we are in this season to remember that you're talking with real people from real places. And so I was looking even earlier through our church photo directory just to remember some of the faces and places uh, where you are. And I'm not just talking about physical places. Dear family, I know that you're also in some emotional places, some hard places. We're in places of confusion, disappointment, fear, frustration, uncertainty, perhaps even despair. And that's the hardest place of all because when we begin to lose hope, we begin to lose so many other things. We begin to lose the courage that we need to face the day and the week and the moment that we're in. And so I want to talk with you today from the scriptures about courageous hope, a hope that fuels courage. Now, when I think of that, I'm reminded of this past Wednesday. It was my son Matthias's 10th birthday, and we took some time in the backyard and played some baseball. We simulated a baseball game that day. So as he fielded the ball and threw it back to me, you know, he could get runs scored against him or he could score runs in that process. And he was doing really well with this little simulation. But it got to a point in one game where early in the game, he fell behind in the game by about seven runs. He was down seven nothing. He was dropping some balls, throwing some wild balls. And at one point I turned behind me to pick up one of the wild throws and I turned back and there Matthias was across the yard, sitting on the ground, glove in the grass, head in his hands. And the poor guy, it was his birthday, but he was feeling so discouraged and defeated. And so I walked over to Matthias and I knelt down next to him, put my arm around him. And just whispered to him, buddy, it's okay. He said, just shaking his head, he didn't want to hear it. I said, it's okay. You can get back up. You can still win this game. We can still have some fun. Let's try to finish. I'm going to help you, and you can still win. Well, just that assurance of hope that he could still win and the assurance of my help ended up empowering him to get up to start making some plays back in the game. And with a little help from me, he did end up winning that simulation. Now, as I think of that picture, my son across the yard, sitting on the ground, head down, head in his hands, glove on the grass. It reminds me perhaps of how many of us in our world today, in our nation, in our region feel in the midst of this crisis, this coronavirus crisis that we're in. We can lose heart, feel discouraged, feel even defeated, and lose hope. And I believe it's in times like this when Jesus wants to kneel down next to us, put his arm around us, and begin to speak his hope to us that we can still win, that he's going to help us in ways that'll give us courage to face the day. That's what I see in the scriptures consistently. God gives hope that gives his people courage I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 15, one of the greatest chapters in the New Testament on the resurrection of Christ. And having described that resurrection, Jesus says, thanks be to God. He gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. See, the hope of the resurrection is meant to give God's people courage to face the day. What I want to do today is look at a specific promise of hope in a specific situation in the life and history of God's people and, and look to the example of how they responded to that in their day in ways that would give us hope and courage today. And where I want to go this morning is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Even as I say that verse, some of you are familiar with it. Feel free to quote it with me as, as I read it from Jeremiah 29, 11. The Lord says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. 
Now, there's a reason that verse is refrigerator material. It finds its way onto our refrigerators. It gets posted on Instagram. We love to share that verse because of the hope that it gives us. But that verse is part of a letter that's part of a greater context in history and in the life of God's people. It's a letter written by the prophet Jeremiah, who's ministering around 600 BC, and he's trying to warn people that if they don't repent and turn back to God, that God's going to come and judge his people, and he's going to use the nation of Babylon to bring ruin to his own people, the people of Israel, and even to deport them to Babylon, just like God did to the northern kingdom uh, over a hundred years earlier from another foreign power, Assyria. Jeremiah is warning them to get right with God, but in fact, they don't listen, and Babylon does come, and they come in three waves, 605 BC, 597 BC, 586 BC, real times in history when Babylon comes upon Jerusalem, invades it, attacks it, takes people back captive to Babylon until finally in 586 BC, the whole city lies in ruin. Now, it's in that second wave of invasion and deportation that Jeremiah writes this letter. See, he's not writing to people who have merely had a hard day in the office. He's writing to people whose nation has fallen. Their families have been torn apart. They've lost control. They've lost all sense of comfort and routine. He's writing to people in a very hard place. So he says, well, what is this? Is he sugarcoating or something? For I know the plans I have for you. It doesn't sound like you know that, Lord. No, he's not sugarcoating at all. In fact, verse 10 makes that very clear. This verse doesn't make it onto refrigerators, doesn't get posted on social media, because it says that when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. In other words, God says this trial that they're in the midst of, this captivity is going to last 70 years. That means most people in the midst of it aren't ever going to see Jerusalem again. Well, where's the hope in that? Oh, my friends, the hope in that is that somehow that's part of a bigger program, a bigger picture, a bigger purpose in the history of God. And in fact, it is. And as we read the rest of this letter today, I pray it gives you a greater hope. It gives you a greater courage to face the day. Let's read the rest of this letter and try to understand what's going on here. We're going to start in verse 4, the beginning of this letter, Jeremiah chapter 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, Listen to that. First, God calls himself the Lord Almighty. That's the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the, the, the Lord of any you know, military and government in the world. He's saying to his people, even while they're being carried to Babylon, he's still over and above that somehow. He still has ultimate authority and, and he's still in control. And it didn't feel that way, but it was that way. And he still was not ashamed to be called the God of Israel. Even when they had turned on him, he was not ashamed to be known as their God. And he even says that I carried them into exile. God takes responsibility for the trial that they're going through. Oh, in our crisis today with this coronavirus, everyone's blaming each other. You know, leaders are blaming other countries and other leaders for this crisis. My friends, God takes responsibility for what's happening here. I don't believe he's the author of evil, but he's highlighting how he is over all of these circumstances, orchestrating them all to bring about his very best in this world and in the life of his people. He wants us to know that ultimately he is up to something. In the midst of whatever's going on in the world, in the midst of whatever we wake up to, God is up to something. He's doing things beyond even our own understanding in ways that bring about his purpose and his big picture in this world. Goes on in verses 5 and 6, he says, Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Uh, give them uh, to others in marriage, that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Look, what he's saying, 
fundamental he is. And this is not what they want to hear because they think, great, you carried us into exile. God, how long until you bring us back? Well, we've already seen it's going to be 70 years. He's saying, get comfortable. It's going to be a while. Plant some gardens, build some relationships, find some work, get comfortable. We don't like to hear that in the midst of trials. But isn't that what it's felt like in these recent weeks and months with this coronavirus? Each, each headline, we hope that it's, it's going to be coming toward an end, that something's going to change. And it just seems like all the restrictions are getting longer and everything's going to take longer than we thought. And we don't know how long it's going to be. And God says to his people in those situations, I am over this. I am orchestrating all of this for my good. Get comfortable. Take a deep breath. Settle into what I am trying to do. See, there's a new normal that God's people have to get used to at times in the scriptures. And it's true for us today because the point is on your bulletin, if you've got your notes, that trials tend to overstay their welcome. Trials tend to overstay their welcome. And that's hard. And we wish they were over much sooner. I'm reminded in the New Testament when the Apostle Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he's describing a situation in, in which he calls it there's a thorn in his flesh. God has allowed this thorn in his flesh, this physical ailment of some kind that's hindering him in life and ministry. And he says three times, I asked God to take it away. I believe that's three desperate times, you know, seasons of seeking the Lord. God, please take this away. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, because my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul learns through those very difficult seasons that when he is weak, he writes, he is strong. Because in his weakness, he's turning to God for strength. Now listen, if anyone could find a shortcut through a trial or around a trial, it was the Apostle Paul. This was a man who had literally raised people from the dead. Had such miraculous power that, that he could take a hand towel out of his pocket and, and throw it across the room. And people would pass it around and get healed. And yet even he in this situation is not immune to suffering. If anyone could say, no weapon fashioned against me can stand and stand in that promise and protection of God, it was the Apostle Paul. But he's suffering. He's in a trial that won't go away. And there's no easy way out, but what God is reinforcing to him is that as he looks to God's promises, he can know that God is at work in a greater way to orchestrate a greatest purpose than what he even understands. Because the hope that God wants to give us is not a hope attached to any specific set of circumstances that we might envision. It's a hope much greater than that. Than in whatever circumstances God has allowed. That he is at work to orchestrate his program in this world even in a way that is for our ultimate good. And if that is true, then we can know that he is for us and at work in whatever day we wake up to. Verse 7 of Jeremiah 29, then in the letter, God says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God says, bless Babylon. That's so hard for them to hear. They had thought of Babylon as the enemy of them and of God. God says, no, bless them. I have a purpose for you in this. It's bigger than you understand. Be a blessing. Verses 8 and 9. Yes, this is what the Lord says. Don't let the prophets and, and diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to them. They're prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. And God wants his people to know in the midst of this season. See, there were people lying all throughout Jeremiah's day saying, it's not going to be that bad. You know, God is going to bless you. He's going to, you know, take care of this and, and just go on and, and do what you do. It's not going to be that bad. God says, don't listen to them. Listen to Jeremiah. Listen to my word through my prophets. Listen to me. We've got to do that. And when they do that, that's when they hear that there's 70 years uh, coming for them, uh, for God to complete 
uh, in this season. In verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. But then verse 12 to 14, so key. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, and I'll bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And God calls them to seek him with all their heart. Well, so what did this look like for them? How did they take this promise of God, stand in it, and even pivot into their new space, their new reality, their new opportunity? Well, we see that. We see that in the book of Daniel. We see that. I'm going to turn to Daniel chapter 9. Because Daniel the prophet is taken into captivity in that first wave of attack in 605 B.C. He, he ends up in Babylon as a teenager. He's brought into really the service of the government there. And as he serves the Lord and looks to bless other, God just uses him in a mighty way. But he's there for decades. And at the end of those decades, in chapter 9, it says this, In the first year of Darius, this is the year 539 B.C. It's about 66 years after Daniel first went there. And he's reading the prophet Jeremiah. And it says that he understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting, and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Do you see what's happening here? He's received... Uh, Jeremiah's letter, the whole book of Jeremiah, he sees it as scripture, as the word of the Lord. He sees it 70 years, that it's almost time. And he seeks the Lord with all his heart. He says, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant, we've sinned and done wrong. We've been wicked and have rebelled. We have not listened to your servants and to all uh, of those prophets and those who spoke in your name to our kings and to our people. He says in verse 17, Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen, forgive, hear, and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. And it's in the midst of this desperate prayer. He's seeking the Lord with all of his heart. That God then does this. It says, while I was speaking and praying in verse 20, confessing the sin, my sin and the sin of my people. He's taking collective responsibility for the sin of the people. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, appears to him and gives him instruction. And, and to summarize this, we looked at this prophecy back in December in a message. It's a prophecy of the 77s when God reveals kind of his timeline for history and how in the course of time, God's going to bring about Messiah. And ultimately, it says everlasting righteousness. He's going to put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness and anoint Messiah who becomes Jesus. You see, it's in the midst of this seeking the Lord at the end of this 70-year captivity period that God reveals the next part of his plan, that God takes the next step in his program, that God gives promise again of an everlasting righteousness. And, and see, they're just looking for temporary relief. And God, here's your point, God always over delivers on his promise. He's longing to give much more than just temporary relief. He's longing to give them assurance of an everlasting righteousness. A, a, a righteousness in a kingdom that is perfect, where there's no more tear, no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain, no more disease, no more sickness, where Jesus reigns in all of his righteousness, in all of his peace, in all of his life. And if he's going to do that, the idea that God is going to do that, then guess what? He can handle today. If he can handle eternity, then he is for us today. He who did not spare his own son, remember, but gave him up for us all. If he gave up Jesus, how will he not also graciously give us all things? If to fulfill his program, he's willing to give up Jesus, his own son, then surely he is at work to give us all things, to give us the courage we need to face today, even while we wait on him to fulfill his 
greater promise. And so we got to seek the Lord with all our heart, like Daniel, to make sure we gain understanding as much as we can of what God is doing and, and, and know what he is calling us to do in response to him. He's going to over deliver on his promise. And this is a time, as your point says, to seek him with all of our heart. But, you know, what does that mean? For one thing, go on that dayandnight.org, dayandnight.org. It's going to call us to prayer and fasting. A number of you have done that already since I talked about it uh, earlier this week. Join me in finding a way extra to seek the Lord. But what does it just look like practically? Let me give you three things to keep in mind as we look to seek the Lord. Number one, listen for the Lord's voice. Okay, these are three things we learned from Jeremiah and Daniel. Now, Jeremiah has been listening to the Lord's voice for his whole ministry. Everyone else is telling him he's crazy. He's hearing the voice of God. There's all kinds of right now, you know, messages from, from media and, and, and government and, you know, the world and even other brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're trying to factor all that and make sense of this. But first, just first and foremost, listen to the Lord, hear his word, stand on his promises Keep it simple in that way. That's why we're trying to have these live stream situations. We're trying to do live stream on Wednesday nights as well at 7. We're creating opportunities that you've heard about midweek to connect with the word of God and to seek him in prayer. Don't forget the book of Luke. We'll be jumping back in there too. You can still be reading three chapters of that every day. Find ways to listen for the Lord's voice. Number two, lock onto God's promises. Okay, he's given us these promises. We've been talking about the promise of God. Lock into them. Step into them. Bank on them. I was reading a, about a book that came out called Made for Brave by Elisa. Uh, her, the author's name is Elisa. And her husband's name is Nick Magnotti. And she's writing about, in part, this. When her husband, Nick, was 25 years old, and he was diagnosed with a rare appendix cancer, at this time in his life, he'd been married for three years to Elisa, would have a daughter with her, but his life would be taken from him two and a half years later by this cancer. And yet in the midst of his cancer, he writes this, if I could bring one person to the Lord, all the pain and discomfort would be worth it. I tell anyone and everyone that will listen my story. I show them how even when looking death in the face, I still have a big smile on my face. The secret is God. His strength, his love throws, flows through my body every day. No one knows when their time will come, so make the most of the day. But not just by doing things that make you happy. Do things that will bring other people joy and peace. Smile at the person in front of you at the grocery store. Tell a random person at the gas station that you hope they have a blessed day. God has taken this cancer and turned it into a blessing. It's my tool, my tool to spread the word of his grace and glory. I thank him every day for giving me that tool. In the last year and a half, I have told more people about God than in the other 24 years of living on this earth. You see, even in the midst of his cancer, he has a hope for all of eternity, for an everlasting peace and righteousness that gives him courage. My friends, as her book title says, we were made for brave. We were made for this. We as the people of God ought to look different than the rest of the world in the way we respond to crisis. As, as he says, and even in a greater way now, we shouldn't be overwhelmed and irritable at grocery stores and in the course of all this. We have a greater hope. We, we can smile at, at others. We can encourage others. We can bless others because we're locked in to God's promise, my friends. Because we, we have a hope and we can reflect the, the fact that that hope makes a difference in our lives. We can, and your third point is, just as he's trying to do, look for unique opportunities. There's going to be unique opportunities in this season to make a difference in the lives of others. Look for those opportunities. Pray for those opportunities. Jeremiah tells people, Remember, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. Pray to the Lord that it would prosper. Because as it prospers, you will prosper. See, wherever we go, we're meant to bring blessing to that space. If God's people could bring blessing to Babylon, we can bring blessing to our world today. But we've got to look for those opportunities. Who can we share hope with? Who can we invite to watch a live stream? Who can we invite into one of our Zoom discussion groups? However long this season goes, 
uh, when we're able to resume meeting together again, how can we make a difference? Who can we invite? Who can we share with? That's what Daniel does. By the time he's a teenager, first in the kingdom, he's purposing in his heart not to defile himself. And he's looking to bring blessing to his world, even while standing true to his conviction. He does that as a teenager. He does that in the lion's den. He does that throughout the decades in Babylon. And he writes in Daniel chapter 12, Verse 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Oh, my friends, and in this season, as we look to, to lead and encourage and support and bless others, we will shine like the stars in heaven. We will give hope to those who feel a sense of exile, who, who feel a sense of isolation, who feel a sense of captivity, that there is one that has come for his captive people. Jesus Christ came into our world to rescue us captives from sin and death through his death and resurrection for us, to bring us into relationship with him and ultimately everlasting righteousness. We are no foreigners to a God who comes to rescue the captive and is present at times like this in the life of his people. I pray, my friends, that you will shine like stars as you step and stand in God's promises and look to bless others. May God bless you as you do that. In Jesus' name.